Hello guys, welcome back to John's Workshop. In this video, this is going to be the third in the Workshop Tips series and we're going to be talking about balance cuts. So what do we mean by balance cuts? So balance cuts is a way and it's used a lot in industry and I've seen it many many times used. I've programmed it many many times on CNC gear and it's a, it's a good way of controlling finished diameters, especially fine limit finished diameters on material and it's something that I've seen quite a few people struggling with including myself, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not estranged from this process and lots of you will be familiar with this when I say we start off you know, hogging big lumps of material off and then as we get closer and closer down to our finish size we start fanny anning around with tiny tiny little cuts and because we don't want to go too small and then we'll typically leave it half a thou big and think I'll just finish that with some emery cloth and that'll be good and and there's lots of reasons why doing all of that is not a good idea and will more often than not invariably lead to you going undersize rather than staying on the plus side so in this episode we're going to talk about that sort of finish finish cuts on a lathe, finish turning fine limit diameters. Um, we're, 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 it's all about controlling variables and that will make more sense as we get further into it. Um, we're going to look about tooling, we're going to think a little bit about tooling and we're going to take a closer look at carbide inserts and this is really important for finish turning on any material but especially the harder the material so as you get into the stainlesses and the nickel alloys especially this becomes more of a more of an issue and we're, we're going to talk about the common sort of mistakes and we've just covered a few there but we'll we'll probably try and show some of those in a bit more detail and what's the benefit of balance cuts when using it properly well far more efficient in terms of getting down to your finished size so you'll take far less numbers of cuts to get there it might seem like a little bit inefficient to start with while you're getting everything set up but actually if you count the number of passes you take it will be far less and there will be a far greater chance of you achieving your finish size and a far less chance of you going undersize and having to faff around with emery cloth which then detracts from you know with the best wood in the world even the best people with a bit of emery cloth on a diameter you are not going to polish that as true and as round and as parallel a diameter as you can turn it and hopefully as I said reducing the amount of scrap that you will create as a result of having to remake parts because you've gone under size especially when it's really important like bearing locations and things like that and we'll do some demonstration so without further ado we'll start with the first one of those demonstrations so I'm going to bring you back in we've got the welding table out in front of me and we're going to do a small demonstration to prove a bit of a point and you may wonder what on earth is this crazy man doing so we'll bring you back when we're doing that now you just knew it involved cucumbers didn't you I know you did so <laughs> why am I sat here with a cucumber on the welding table well it's very easy so pay attention because I'm only going to do this once because it makes a mess if you look at a knife any knife the, the blade will always have two edges on it. It will have a ground edge and a sharpened edge and it will have a thicker edge that's not sharp and is blunt. And if you try and cut the cucumber or any other fruit or vegetable for that matter with both of those different edges on the knife you'll get a different result. So I'm going to demonstrate that now. So with the sharp edge of the knife as you'd expect very controllable, very clean cut I'm getting hungry and very repeatable so let's turn the knife upside down and see what happens like I said I'm only doing this once yeah it's not really cutting that well uh, it's not very parallel we'll mic that up in a bit and just see what we've achieved but I don't think that's very good we'll give it another go Yeah, it's really not quite the same. End of demonstration. That will all make perfect sense, I hope, at some point in the very near future. So, 
while we're still dealing with the cucumber we're going to get into the tool control piece now and that's largely what the cucumber demonstration was all about so I hope you remembered how that went what we're going to do now is use some of the technology in the workshop and we're going to look in at tool geometry and why this is really important around the use of balance cuts yes but more so the use of trying to hit a fine limit diameter on a lathe particularly so I'm going to get the microscope set up and we'll get the tablet we're not going to view cucumber particularly but we could have a look at that just to, out of interest we'll get the tablet set up get the camera on the tablet hopefully there won't be too much glare and we're going to look at some of these inserts and just discuss the geometry that you're dealing with with a carbide insert okay so we've got the we've got the technology working so we're looking at a CNMG insert here and we're looking at the cutting radius on the corner and if you look at the cutting edge there what you can see is it's actually blunt it's what you would class as a blunt cutting edge if you tried to wipe this across your fingers it would not really cut your skin it's completely blunt so this is the back edge of the knife that we were talking about and that's a CNMG insert you can get different inserts so we'll move on to a a V-style insert so this is this is sharper so this is a this has got a, like an aluminium geometry on it this insert so it is sharper than the other one we looked at but largely it's still a blunt cutting edge. So we'll look at a D style insert now, a DNMG insert. There we go. So there's our cutting edge. And again, you can see it's blunt, it's got a radius on it. So we'll look at a different V style insert now. Same deal, blunt edge. And you might say, John, this is because you're using big inserts you know they're all they're all great big inserts so we're going to look at a tiny a tiny insert now so this is a tiny SNMG square insert and I'll show you these inserts in a minute on the table but we'll just have a look at that and I can't even tip this one up because it's so small under the microscope lens but guess what same deal rounded off or blunt cutting edge so I've got a piece of high speed steel here at the toolbox and this is ground as a form tool it's probably not the best example but it's just the first one I picked up and because this is ground this is more akin to the sharp edge of the knife so this has got almost a razor sharp edge on it where it's been ground notice I said almost because it's not in perfect condition but it's certainly not lapped or honed it's just ground straight into the high speed steel but that has got a sharp cutting edge on it so that's the that's the sharp edge of the knife so I'm going to come back now and just discuss why that is and what it means in terms of finishing diameters as you can see by the six inch rule I've laid out you can see the size of inserts we're talking from the the sort of CNMG the V style the D style down to the tiny S style and a bit of 3 8 square high speed steel so regular tools regular inserts that most people have got in their hobby shops so why are all these carbide inserts blunt for want of a better word well it's to do with the way they're made so these are what you class as a sintered material so they're pressed together in what's known as a green state which is it comes as a powder these are pressed together under extremely high pressure to form the insert shape and then they are sintered which means they go into a an autoclave type environment and they get heated to such a high temperature that the the actual powder material becomes fluid and starts to bond itself together and that's what you end up with an insert so that's why the edges on these are all the same because of the process that of how they're made and it's quite interesting to note as well it's a very very finely tuned process the sintering process so these inserts when they're in their green state will actually be bigger than they are when they're in their sintered state and that's a very very tightly controlled process obviously so that your finished insert is always the right size to fit the tool 
quite an interesting process. Um, if you're interested, go and have a look at it. It's there's plenty of information on the internet on how these things are made. So why is it important? Well, the reason it's important is because when you're cutting your finished diameter, and we'll use the cucumber again, and I know this is the wrong way around, we'll turn the insert around. When you're cutting your finished diameter, carbide inserts like these need to be buried in the material. So while you're taking 0.2 millimeters, eighth hour depth of cut, that kind of thing, they're quite happy, they will cut consistently and they'll cut consistently well. Um, there's different geometries, there's different chip breakers, there's different types of carbide for different materials, there's different coatings, there's, there's a whole another episode that we're not going to cover here but largely we're just talking the geometry and the way carbide's made. You can actually get ground carbide inserts which are more akin to the high speed steel so they're a ground finish and they will cut very very small amounts of material but the the issue you've got with carbide inserts is as I said then they need to be buried in the material so if you're trying to finish a fine limit diameter you're gradually going smaller and smaller you get down to the I've got two thou left to go so I'm gonna I don't want to take it all off at once so I'm gonna put half a thou cut on and see what I get what I end up with what happens is as the tool goes through the material it will skate over the surface for a while and then some of the material will build up on the tip of the tool on the very cutting edge of the tool some of the material will build up on it and then what happens is it will dig in and it will remove a small amount of material and then the bit that's stuck on will get removed and then it will start skating over the surface again some more material will build up it will dig in again potentially and typically on softer steels like mild steel and things like that that's what happens and when you look at your finished surface it looks like a ploughed field you'll have bits that look good and then you'll have furrows in it where the where the diggings happened and that's all because the insert is not cutting as it's been designed to do it's skating across the surface and picking material up very very difficult to control a fine limit diameter with a tool that's behaving like that incredibly difficult so how, how do you avoid that? Well, you, you, you don't get down to those half a thou depths of cut with carbide is, is the short answer. Um, because if you do, you're going to encounter that problem with standard regular carbide inserts like this and not non-ground ones in softer materials. You're going to run into that problem time and time again. It's guaranteed. Um, so moving that on a stage further then, so how can we stop that happening? Well you need to think about your cut depths as you're getting down to your finish size and making sure that your cuts are always more than what the insert is designed to take if that makes sense so that you're not getting yourself into that position and I've seen it many times on hard materials so if we start talking about nickel alloys now on a CNC machine in aerospace I've seen this so many times it's happened to me so many times because it's very easy on a CNC machine you can dial in you know five tenths of a thou offset rerun the cut nothing happens you know you dial a couple of tenths in rerun the cut again nothing happens dial another couple of tenths in rerun the cut still nothing happens you dial another couple of tenths in rerun the cut guess what it takes the whole lot that you've dialed in in increments all in one go and you've gone under size so it's exactly the same issue on a CNC machine as it is on a manual machine no different and that's all to do with the geometry of the inserts so what we're going to do now is move over to the lathe, we're going to set some material up in the lathe and we're going to talk about balance cuts and how you can use balance cuts to do two things. One is to enable you to use carbide effectively within its proper cutting range and two how you can be more efficient by using balance cuts and how you can guarantee your diameter by controlling variables. Actually we're not going to move to the lathe, we're going to go back up to the whiteboard and we're going to just going to quickly discuss what the variables are that we need to control. So with all the vegetable fun over and done with we'll get back to the board and we'll talk about controlling the variables. So on a finished cut or on, a, on any cut but if you're going to do a finished cut it's controlling the variables that's really really important and here's a list of the variables and I'm just going to quickly run down the list so I've put material there and red crosses by it. 99% of the time the material is going to be the same 
from your first roughing cut right the way down to your finished cut. Not always the case, you could be turning a composite material, you could be turning a welded assembly, so you've got the two different materials between weld and base material, those types of things, but 99% of the time it will be the same material. So we're ruling material out as a variable for this particular thing, so we'll look at the rest of them. So surface speed is a variable. Now I've put a pair of glasses by that, <laughs> meaning a watch point. And what I mean by that is on a CNC lathe, dead easy to control, G96 command, constant surface speed, doesn't matter as you incrementally take more and more and more and more and more off and your diameter gets smaller and smaller and smaller the machine will compensate for that and it will retain a constant surface speed all the way down nice and simple on a manual lathe you can't do that so every time you take another cut actually you should be slightly increasing your spindle speed each time as you go down smaller and smaller can't do that on a manual machine so there's a percentage of uncertainty around spindle speed and when we get to do the demonstration on the lathe we can control that within a certain amount but we're always going to have an element of error from that surface speed variable. Depth of cut, well we can maintain that and that's what balance cuts is all about. So as you get down to your finished cut, you and we'll work this out on the lathe in a bit, we'll show this once you've decided what your finished cut size is going to be based on what you do ahead of your finished cut to get good surface finish and everything else, you know what it's going to be. The previous two or three cuts ahead of your finished cut will be the same size, so therefore you rule that out as a variable because you know it's going to be consistent with what you've previously done. Feed rate on a lathe that's got a power travis on it, same deal as depth of cut. You don't change it, <clears throat> you keep it the same as your preceding cuts. Variable ruled out. Temperature. Again, <clears throat> difficult one if you're on a lathe. So I don't use coolant, flood coolant on my lathe. I've got a pump, I've got a tank. I don't use it for two main reasons really. One is I don't want it splashing all over the camera while I'm trying to film. And two, when you start pouring white coolant all over the job that you're actually doing, from a viewer perspective, for you guys, all you see is what looks like a milk float accident you don't get to see what's going on at the cutting edge. So that's really two of the main reasons I don't use flood coolant. So my coolant application is very non-repeatable. So therefore, that's a big variable for me, but there's ways we can control that and we'll come on to that. Push off. Now you see I've drawn an arrow between push off and depth of cut. It doesn't matter what lathe you've got, whether it's a big lathe, a small lathe, a turret lathe, whatever, a CNC lathe, it really doesn't matter. These are the laws of physics and they're absolutely constant. If you change your depth of cut, you will change the amount of push-off that you get. It's as simple as that. There's an absolute relation between those two. And also, similarly, if you... So that's tool push-off, machine push-off. If you get down to really, really tiny diameters, obviously you've then got part deflection, which is different to push-off. So, so you've got both of those things to think about. Backlash in the machine, obviously if you're incrementally moving inwards for your cut, if all of a sudden you go, oh, I've gone too far, and you pull back, and you don't account for your backlash, all of a sudden then that cut is not consistent with the previous cuts that you've done, it will be of a different depth, meaning you've got different push-off, meaning you've got a whole different set of cutting conditions, and you will get a different result as a result of that. And coolant application, you know, again, part of my thing, you know, once you're doing your preliminary cuts ahead of your finished cut, whatever you've got coolant application wise, don't change it. You know, keep the nozzle where it is, keep the coolant strength the same as it was, keep everything the same. It's another variable that we can rule out the list. So we can rule most of those out <clears throat> on a manual machine. There's a couple that we can't, there's a couple that we need to try and manage best we can, but largely the rest of them we can rule those out. And they are all the variables that will change the way the machine behaves when you put a cut on largely and and if the machine behavior changes your finished results going to change and that's when you struggle to control sizes and diameters it's as simple as that so we'll go to the lathe now we'll get the lathe set up we'll chuck a piece of scrap up and we'll go through a bit of an example of balance cuts and we'll do one start to finish to show you how I do it and you'll be able to see that real time how easy it is to shoot for a known size and hit it using the balance cut method by removing all of those variables as we've just discussed.
Alright guys, we're at the lathe. I've got a piece of, uh, it's about 42mm, just mild steel I think, in the chuck. We're just going to face this off, I'm going to take a couple of cuts, um, this is 42 we're going to aim for a nominal 30mm diameter. So I'll show you roughly how I do it and I'll stop in between and just say what I'm doing. I'm probably just going to speed the cutting up because this isn't about watching swarf beer made, this is about the process. And I'm going to machine this end to end, so it's now, where are we? It's four minutes past nine, as we're starting this at night, and I'll show you when we've finished what that looks like. So what we've done there is we've just given it a clean and what I'm doing now is looking at my surface finish and that's not an acceptable surface finish and I took a half mil depth of cut there to give me a millimeter off the diameter I'm probably going to go down smaller than that when we get closer to the finished size I'm probably going to take half mil off the diameter so quarter of a mil depth of cut 10 thou I wouldn't want to go any smaller than that this is a CNMG insert that would be really what I would class as the limit for finished passes on a carbide insert and certainly of that size of carbide insert anyway and that size and geometry so we're going to go a bit faster see what our surface finish is like we're just going to take another cut so it's okay but I think we can get it better. I don't think it's surface speed necessarily. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring that back down to 800 and we're going to go for a faster feed rate. Yeah, it's probably a bit too fast. So that's better, so I'm happy with that spindle speed and feed rate that that's giving me a good surface finish with a half a mil cut off the diameter. So there are my parameters set. So I'm now going to come down to 30 mil diameter and this is what I was talking about earlier. As I gradually come in smaller and smaller my surface speed is going to change. So this surface finish will change slightly and the amount of push off that I get will change slightly but as we get close to finish size the push off should be fairly static it will just be the surface finish that may alter you don't get the best brilliant finish on this stuff anyway but so I'm just going to give that a quick measure we're just going to start off with the vernier see where we're at right so we're 37.5 5.3 so what I'm going to do there is I'm going to take 1.5 mil off which will get us down to 36 so I'm at a round number so it's important to do that now before you get close to your finished diameter because your last three or four cuts need to all be the same size as I said earlier so if you've got oddments which we've got here i.e. a 0.53 now's the time to get rid of that so you're working with round numbers so we're aiming for 30 so we're going to get this down to 36 and then from 36 in um, I know I've got 6 mil to come off so 3 mil aside and I can choose the flavour of those but the la certainly the last 3 cuts or 4 cuts will all be the same size and that's balanced cuts and we'll get to that bit so we'll get the 1.5 mil off now So that should be us at 36. Yeah, we're 3601 with a vernier, so I'm happy with that. So from here on in, we're going to be using a micrometer. So I'm going to get this down now to about 33, so I can take another 3 mil off, which we'll do now. So we're 33.05.
five on there and I'm going to use the ratchet all the way through here just for consistency so we're 33055 so I'm now going to start my balance cuts a series of balance cuts to get us down to our finished size so we're going to pick half a millimetre now on the first half a millimetre cut I'm going to address the 055 bit so we're going to go 0 0.5 five five on the first cut so that's what we'll do now so that's a prime example of balance cuts and why they're important so I thought I'd gone for the 055 there. Now because this cut was smaller than the preceding cut the push off was different so despite the fact I dialed that in on the cross slide you can see it's not quite made it. So it's 0 0.025 shy of where it should have been. So that took less material off than I was expecting it to and this is, a, this is a thing, the minute you start changing around and messing around with your cut depths everything's different as I said earlier and that's why you struggle to achieve that so I now know I've still got a 0 0.025 to address so we're going to grab that on the next cut Okay, so we're now going to shoot for, I've got two cuts left, um, so what I've been doing there in the last couple of cuts is taking the same amount, confirming what I've taken off, same amount again, confirming what I've taken off, surface finish is still good, I'm not changing any parameters, everything's the same on each cut, so the only thing I'm not really controlling is temperature, but this is ambient, there's no heat in that at all, so I'm happy that we're good. So I've got two more cuts to go, which we'll do now. So this is my final confirmation that everything with the balance cuts is going okay. So it has moved slightly. but only very slightly, I'm 0 0.01 or just over 0 0.01 plus. So I'm now going to go for my final cut. And I did knock the, I did knock the compound, the cross slide a tiny bit more only a tiny bit, less than half a graduation to try and address that 0.01 that I'd got and you can see there we're down to 0 0.005 probably so I'm slightly plus there so I'm, I'm 5 microns away from my 30 mil and that's you know there's been no faffing about, no fanning about, no emery paper I've got the same surface finish that I had when I did my test out at the start of the start of the session so as I was working my way in so I knew my surface finish was good at that depth of cut that speed that feed rate so all of that's the same so I, I, my, you know, I've not changed anything and you can see there I shot straight for the 30 mil and you know I'm within five microns which for a home shop you know to be splitting microns any closer than that if I'm honest on a lathe without a DRO so you know I'm just working straight off the graduations on the cross slide on this machine you know you can't really ask for much better than that it, it, you look at the draw you might get a couple of microns rather than five but I'm fairly confident with that so I hope that shows that so what we're going to do now I'm just going to move the camera show you the surface finish I got there and 
I start. I know I said it was six minutes past. I've done a lot of waffling in the middle of that. It's now twenty-two minutes past. So you can see, you know, with, if taking the waffling out in between, that's took probably two or three minutes of actual machining time. Um, it, it, you know, to get to hit that finish size. So you can see my surface finish that I've got. You know, reasonable surface finish for mild steel. Certainly can't feel anything on there. It's not. It's not all bitty and ploughed fieldy. Nice uniform surface finish. So there we go, guys. I hope that's been useful. I could do. I, I you know, I'd really like to do more and more of that because I could talk about this for a long time. There's a lot more. I, there's just not enough time in an episode to get all my thoughts out on what I'm doing when I'm doing it. So I've tried to give you the thinking behind it there. Tried to show you how to get your lathe set up before you get to your finished cut so you've sorted your surface finish out you've sorted your speeds and feeds out and then you lock it all down and you just keep going with the same depth of cut once you've got rid of the oddments and you know, largely unless one of these variables comes into play i.e. temperature or one of the other ones that is difficult to control surface speed on a manual machine as we've spoken about the lathe will do the same thing every time I could have made that easier, far easier for myself by putting a, a DTI on the cross slide and actually reading the value off the DTI just rather than you know shooting for the graduations on the cross slide. That would have made it more accurate, more easy. That's a way to do that better. But largely that's the process. It's very, very easy. And once you've done it a few times, it's just having the confidence in knowing that the lathe's going to do what you're dialing in because you've got all of these variables under control and everything's good so I'm ho I hopefully that's helped a few people because I have seen a few people struggling with this if I'm honest and resorting to the emery cloth and you know resorting to taking spring passes and, and, and yes sometimes you do need to take spring passes especially through bores and things like that but for ODs, OD turning you really don't need to if you set your lathe up properly to start with providing you've got a power travis you know if you're winding by hand there's too many variables in there, you're not going to be consistent. But if you've got a power traverse and you've got a consistent cutting forces and you're controlling the variables, the lathe will, it's, it's a machine, it's not got any intelligence, it will do the same thing time after time after time, providing it's in reasonable condition, you've got good bearings and all the rest of it. So, hope that was helpful, hope that was useful. As I said, probably on the first one of these that I did I, um, and I think I missed it on the second workshop tips I was always going to try and throw a little bit of a funny story from my past in, into the mix so I've been trying to think about things that kind of fit the topic of this and I'm really struggling if I'm honest but there's one in particular and this was not I, I never saw this by the way this is a story that I was told by a guy that I used to work with many 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 years ago and they'd taken a new guy on in the in the shop and he was supposed to be you know the the, the mutts nuts he was supposed to be a really good guy knew his stuff um you know fully skilled fully skilled guy and <laughs> they put him on they put him on crankshafts and these were big crankshafts you know well they weren't i've seen bigger but these were sort of i don't know a good meter long probably three three and a half foot long something like that crankshafts were probably six cylinders or something on they're probably off tractors or something i can't remember and i'd done the job many many times and largely it was a case of setting them up in a four jaw and and setting them offsetting them setting them on center so you're doing bearing journal main bearing journals and also crank bearing journals and this was to relieve the web each side to allow the crank then to go and be reground on the journals and they put some smaller size shelves in and and recondition them that way so basically you're just machining the webs out and machining some of the surface of the of the actual crank diameter itself the bearing journal diameter <laughs> and uh, there's some quite setup required and this guy apparently i didn't see it but this one of the guys i worked with told me about this this guy was spotted on i think it was day two of his uh, his new job and uh, <laughs> He had one hand behind his back and he had the other hand on the cross slide and he had the lathe turning really, really slowly and he just got, he'd got the thing on centre, he'd not used any offset in the four jaw and he was stood there and he was basically 
winding the cross slide in and out like this as the, <laughs> as the crankshaft was going around trying to turn the webs and keep it all concentric to the to the actual uh, s cylinder bearing journals as it was going well you can imagine it didn't take very long before that ended in a complete disaster and I think he 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 was told to leave uh, fairly quickly after that so I never saw the guy again but that was just a funny story that it, even though I didn't see it, it will stick with me just hearing the guy that told me about it this day. Uh, I found that quite funny. So anyway, I hope you've all enjoyed that. I hope that's been something useful for you. Um, if anybody's got any questions about the balance cuts, you know, I've done my best to try and explain it. But if anyone's got any questions, you know, feel free, stick them in the comments. I'll do my best to try and answer them, try and help you out. But, but you know, my, my advice here is give it a go. And, and you know, if you don't want to give it a go on something that matters, do what I've done. Chuck a bit of scrap in the lathe. When you've got, you know, you're scratching your head wondering what to do one day and you don't want to start a project, stick a bit of scrap up and just play with it. Give it a go and play with it. And what you'll do is you'll build confidence in your machine. You'll build confidence in your own ability to be able to hit those diameters without all that faffing around with emery cloth and trying to take tiny little skin passes and stuff because it's it's not it's not that difficult if you get everything set right so as i said thank you hope that was useful thank you for subscribing thank you for watching and we'll catch you all very soon on another video when we'll be making something else